Okay, so it looks like we are moving on to our next uh, show. We're going to be doing the four methods of healing. So we will be looking at the four methods of healing in SAF. Uh, we have them broken down. Time, automatic self-regeneration, prevention, allopathy, or allopathy, which is anti-disease, and the control method, like heals like. The necessity to repair the energy mistakes and accidental injuries of the human body reaches back to the beginning of time. A vital step in the process of living and evolving has been to always attempt to correct the malfunctions of any and various parts of the body. This is the way of all life energy forms on the earth. If a leaf develops a fungus that might eventually destroy the entire plant, then measures would have to be taken to eradicate the condition before it became any worse. The plant genetics may dictate pinching off life, giving nourishment, so the leaf withers and falls to the ground. If a wild animal injures its paw in a fight with another animal, then actions would have to be taken to repair the damage so the animal could continue to its struggle for survival the next day. The animal may automatically retreat and lick its wounds. If a human being contracts an illness, a malformation of bone, or an inhibition towards the creation of power in the body, then measures would have to be taken against these conditions in order to prevent the ultimate destruction of the entire human organism. All organisms, this includes man, animal, vegetable, or mineral, must maintain a status of healthy operation so that they can survive. The changes of the moon and stars or intense disturbances to Mother Earth, such as volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, and floods, are also considered malfunctions that directly or indirectly affect all the living organisms on the planet. So today we're going over the four methods of healing. Number one, time. Automatic self-regeneration. Time has been put forth as the healer of all wounds. Of course, this axiom has been proven wrong many times by those who have had unhealed injuries or emotional traumas, suffered and lived with these throughout the years, and eventually took these with them to the grave. The fact is, time heals nothing. Instead, it is the actions taken by the most basic energies within each organism that bring about changes toward healing and better performance. All organisms, including mankind, depend upon the cogent energies that are within every genetic structure. All organisms that live and breathe, and this includes the minerals that make up the physical structure of the earth, are blessed with healing forces and powers of self-regeneration. When a body becomes injured, these basic energies are commanded to repair the injury and are thus thrust into action as an automatic response. In former times, man had very few medicines to depend upon when he or she was ill, injured, or sick. He had to allow his body to heal itself, and this action was one that required all of the power that the physical body could muster and command. The healing energies within the body precluded any activity. Each and every living thing that became injured needed rest. Rest is an intrinsic restoration action built into every living organism, so the major and minor injuries of the day can be repaired. Those who live out a normal existence without gross pain or illness still require a sizable amount of relaxation to restore the energies of the body. Plants, animals, human beings, all living creatures must rest to restore and rejuvenate themselves. When we become very ill, we require a tremendous amount of rest. Rest allows the energies within the body to go through the changes necessary to refresh living beings for action the following day. The cycle of regeneration may be fast or slow, depending upon the energy held in reserve. It is this factor that causes the confusion of time in relation to healing. While one person may have a cold for a single day, another may have it for a week, a month, 
or most of the winter. Complete healing depends upon the automatic self-regeneration qualities of the genes, and not the elusive actions of the clock. But, in the final analysis, time must always be figured into any program designed for healing. The second method of healing, prevention. Automatic self-regeneration, however, is not as effective as it has been in the past generations. Eons have passed since the beginning of man's existence on the planet, and it has been discovered that those energetic qualities of regeneration within the body are losing power. With all the modern-day assaults on our physical being, we are not now as strong of constitution as in the past. As mankind has progressed at a certain rate, the environment has changed much more rapidly. In the last 5,000 years of Earth's history, and especially in the last 100 years, resting to relieve injuries and illnesses has become less and less workable as a cure. Ben Franklin saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, signifies the need on the part of every organism to protect itself from possible injury. Protection and prevention have been effective methods to avoid destructive activities. Prevention is reliable against disease, injury, and illness, but it requires that mankind and other organisms be less active because it is activity that dictates huge amounts of time for rest and regeneration. It is activity that sets up the possibility of injury, and it is activity that requires energy that could be used instead for regeneration. In the early 1930s, when athletes became exhausted, they were told to rest for a year or two and then start training again. This was a preventative prescription so that the athlete would not become sick and die. After a period of rest, the athlete could be regenerated to run, swim, or play ball again. It was not known at the time that energies that helped regenerate the body, such as minerals, vitamins, and enzymes, were depleted and could be replenished for a more rapid recovery. With today's professional athlete, recovery from injuries seems amazingly fast through super nutrition, machinery, and electric stimulating devices, and certain exercises to help hasten health. Prevention includes learning as much as we can about what helps and what hinders our health and energy levels, and establishing good nutrition and healthy ways of living. If we veer off course, it is best to make changes quickly and not wait until we become ill. Prevention dictates that we impose a moratorium on those activities and situations that might do us harm. The third method of healing, allopathy, anti-disease. Rest and prevention as methods of curing the body have become somewhat of a boring subject to modern mankind, because humans, animals, and even plants and minerals are organisms of spontaneous action and activity. So, it became necessary to find the proper equalizers to aid in the quick repair of the body. As long as we remain energetic, there is the distinct possibility we will have accidents, illnesses, and injuries. It was Dr. Samuel Hahnemann, a German physician, who coined the term allopathy to differentiate what he called the old school of medicine from the new science he formed, homeopathy. The word allopathy means other suffering or other than the disease and refers to the use of products that had nothing to do with the symptoms of the disease but instead were sent in to attack the disease or quell the person. Hahnemann defined allopathic medicine as using opposites to treat opposites. With the allopaths, it was a matter of try this, no, try that, no, abandon that way. Here is a new one to try. During Hahnemann's day, 1755 to 1843, the accepted medical practices included bloodletting, often with leeches, to treat diseases by releasing the bad along with the blood, and using high doses of arsenic and mercury for cures of such diseases as syphilis. Allopathic medicine in Hahnemann's day was based on what could be seen with the eye or felt with the hand. Until such time that it could be seen or felt, the allopath said there was no disease. 
Why then did the patient still feel lousy? No energy. Many aches and pains. Depression. From experience, we know that by the time a disease is dense enough to be felt or seen, even on an x-ray or under a microscope of today, it is very much a mass, a tumor. When the allopath did see something, it was diseased tissue. When he found the tissue, he declared a disease had been found because it was seen. It was considered a malfunction of the body. If it was a diseased lung or liver or kidney, cut out the diseased part and the disease should be gone. If it was a disease on the skin, cut it off and the disease, the disease will be healed. These methods were undertaken to attack the malfunction the diseased tissue. A drug or similar poison must summarily go after any inconsistency in the well-being of the person. The science of allopathy is directed against the disease of the body, and hopefully not against the body as a whole, although arsenic and mercury did just that. Depending upon the strength of the invader, such as a virus, it may become necessary when using a prescribed allopathic drug to continually increase the dosage to achieve the desired effect. This means that by using allopathic methods, a person, animal, or plant can become addicted to the drug in ever-increasing amounts and may need to use it as a permanent replacement of their own automatic self-regeneration capabilities. By following allopathic methods, in the case of a fungus attacking a plant, an antifungal agent would be applied to the whole plant. If an animal contracted anthrax, then an anti-anthrax medicine would be employed to destroy the disease. If a human being caught a virus, such as the flu, then an antiviral compound would be employed to destroy the invaders. Viruses replicate and mutate rapidly using the host body. So new antivirals must constantly be created in the lab. Witness the flu vaccines updated yearly. Antibiotics such as penicillin and tetracycline are employed to destroy bacterial invaders. That is, until the bacteria evolve and the penicillin is no longer effective. Anti means against. A quick look through the physician's desk reference reveals most modern medicines and drugs, chemicals created in the lab, often of coal tar der derivation, use the prefix anti. Allopathic medicines wage war against disruptive invaders, seen as the disease. The trouble with waging war within the body, however, is a problem of self-destruction. It is similar to the trouble a country encounters when warring against another country. During World War II, the Russians were invaded by Germany. And even though the fearless Russians eventually ousted the Germans, many Russian cities were completely laid to waste. In our present day, many drugs are often a take a similar action in that the person dies from the curative, not the disease. This destructive condition prevails in allopathic treatment because the agents and medicines used to destroy certain energies in the body can become indiscriminative or non-selective. The antibiotic destroys the organisms that are disruptive to the body, but also destroys the helpful bacteria and flora we may sorely need to survive. After bouts of antibiotic use, there is often a bloom of another type of microscopic pest, candida and other yeasts. That said, allopathic remedies are logical. There is no doubt that when the body is invaded, the response should be to eliminate the invader. However, drugs which are antipathetic and opposed to life energy cause a loss of control over the natural healing mechanisms within the body. With strong allopathic drugs, the patient may be misled into thinking something is being done to help him or her, when in fact their symptoms and perceptions are being covered up. When drugs cover our symptoms, as the quality of life decreases, so too does the ability for self-healing. The fourth method of healing, the control method. Like heals like. Dr. Samuel Hahnemann wrote the formula similia similibus curantur. Like is treated or cured by like. Hahnemann's essay, 
a new principle for ascertaining the curative properties of drugs, was published in 1796 in the Heuflin's Journal. This dramatic introduction cast a new thread of light on the idea that like materials could control like areas of the body. These principles were not new to Hahnemann, but were procedures that had been followed for thousands of years through all the great civilizations, the Egyptians, the Chinese, and the Aztecs. The Greek physician, Hippocrates, proclaimed the father of modern Western medicine, wrote, Disease is born of like things, and by the attack of like things people are healed. There was belief long ago, as there is now, that organs and glands of certain animal bodies will rejuvenate similar areas of the human body. In the Egyptian papyrus of Ebers, written around 1500 BC, a formula exists for curing cowardice in the face of battle. The person was instructed to eat the heart of a lion. In the Americas, native tribes ate the hearts and other organs of the animals they had just killed in order to take in that vibrant energy. Other dramatic examples of this principle have been brought forward through history. We understand it today through our science of energy to bring about a proper cure the human should partake of the parts of animals, the frequencies that are most like his or her own ailing body parts. To heal a sick kidney, he or she should eat a kidney. To heal a liver, he or she should eat a liver. And to heal the lungs, pancreas, heart, etc., then the respective organ or gland should be eaten. After childbirth, women were routinely given placenta to eat to help promote a rapid recovery. Placenta is loaded with nutrients to nourish the fetus, a fact known to the ancients. It is also full of hormones which speed healing. Companies today produce glandular products and extracts, thyroid, pancreas, prostate, etc. So instead of eating the whole substance, we buy it in bottles at the store. The use of natural herbs as medicine is as old as time itself. Each part of the world has its own plants that the ancients figured out how to use to treat colds and fevers, skin rashes, broken bones, emotional upsets, and to eliminate lice and other pests. Where a poison plant grows, within a short distance we will find its antidote. For example, the itching effects of poison ivy on the east coast can be stopped by applying mashed or juiced jewelweed, which grows nearby. The itching effect of poison oak in the west can be abated by applying mashed or juiced manzanita leaves, which naturally grows close by. Folk medicine, sometimes called bush medicine, is tried and true and was handed down by word of mouth for millennia. Nicholas Culpepper, an astrologer and physician, produced The Family Herbal in 1649, using only herbs from his native English countryside. He advocated using only one herb at a time, and he taught his patients how to locate and identify the herbs, prepare and use them. Hahnemann approached folk medicine and herbs scientifically and used substances from around the world. Being a physician, he was aware that the active drug substance in the bark of the cinchona tree in Peru, quinine, would cure intermittent fevers. The native peoples in Peru had been using it, and Jesuit missionaries introduced the bark to Europe, where it was called Peruvian bark or Jesuit's bark. Hahnemann had an inquiring mind. He wanted to understand the bark's properties, so he, without, uh, without fevers, ingested it and found that within a few days he had symptoms. He recorded these and his perceptions, fever, intermittent chills, and other malaria-type symptoms. Thus was born the fledgling science of homeopathy, similia similibus curantur. Like is treated or cured by like. A remedy can cure if it can produce similar symptoms in a healthy person. In the late 1700s and early 1800s, the elements, gases, and metals were being discovered and biological specimens and folk medicines from around the world were waiting to be analyzed. Using one herb or element at a time, 
Hanneman experimented with hundreds of materials on healthy people and recorded specific sets of disruptive symptoms, such as anxiety, coated tongue, hair falling out, or shooting pain in the wrist. Then, when the same material was given to people who already had specific symptoms, like anxiety, coated tongue, hair falling out, or shooting pain in the wrist, it had the opposite effect. These patients were relieved of those symptoms. Hanneman studied, codified, and provided this law of nature until, at the time of his death, he had created a Materia Medica for the practical application of this new science. He wrote that a disease begins with humankind first, with the vital force, and only later ends up as a diseased tissue. The effect is the diseased tissue. What is the cause? That was the question for Hanneman and his patients to discover. Symptomatology was of the utmost importance. Early on with the patient, what are the symptoms being presented? Who would know better than the patient themselves? A note must be made here of the term drug substances as used in this lecture or in any study of homeopathy. In our modern age, the term drug refers to recreational use of drugs, prescriptions, narcotics, and mood and mind-altering substances. Drugs in this modern time are compressed chemicals created in the lab from chemicals, coal tar, and other derivatives. These chemicals depend on quantity given. Doctor and patient alike must be diligent about toxicity connected to the amount and frequency that a prescribed drug is consumed and the many side effects these can cause. In the science of SAF, self-awareness formulas, we consider that all prescription and over-the-counter meds act as drugs to the energetic human system. These products are compressed energies and are counter to the energetic frequencies of the human being. These drugs are classified under the allopathic definition of using opposites to cure or treat opposites. The drug materials of a highly diluted homeopathic remedy in homeopathic reference books are herbal drugs, roots, leaves, stems, barks, and flowers, plants. Uh, they can be animal parts and mineral drugs, oxides of magnesia, alumina, zirconia, and alkaline earth strontia. Although using the term drug substances in this lecture, we would not consider homeopathic products drugs, as per the above definition. Drugs used in allopathic medicine with the damaging side effects are regulated by the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. Homeopathy and diluted herbs was an established science in use long before there was an American Medical Association or an FDA, and so are grandfathered in in the act DSHEA in 1994. Today in the USA, only a medical doctor is legally allowed to diagnose. The word is from Greek, dia, through, and gnosis, knowledge. Through knowledge. This is what we all do. Evaluate through our knowledge. Diagnosis. The homeopathic diagnosis of illness came about as a method to understand more totally the principles of curing by control. This method differs from automatic self-regeneration, prevention, and allopathic ideals. It is accelerated and complete. It is similar to rest and prevention because it uses the energies of the body to correctly heal itself. But unlike apathetic or opposition medicines and antibiotic preparations, such as used in allopathic medicine, homeopathic remedies attempt to control each manifestation, problem, injury, trauma, and symptom on its own level, and to disperse and release the body of the effects without injuring the human organism. Because it works with the body's own defenses, this is a rational approach that greatly enhances the success of healing within the body. This is not to say homeopathic remedies can cure all diseases. That wasn't so in Hanneman's time, and it isn't so in our time either. 
Homeopathic practitioners perceive and address the symptoms presented, no matter what the condition might be named. The remedies are not a cure, but rather the stimulus needed for the patient's body to recognize the message and to begin its own healing process, if this is to happen. To give a patient drugs such as opium or morphine shuts off the pain and the symptoms and is considered palliative only, without the possibility for natural healing to ever take place within the patient's body. Homeopathy fits in naturally with the famed Hippocratic Oath, the oath that medical doctors of today and in the distant past swore to uphold upon completion of their training and certification as MDs. To quote, I will give no deadly medicine to anyone. I will prescribe regimens for the good of my patients, according to my ability and my judgment, and never do harm to anyone. Potentization The hallmark of the work of Hanneman is in the dilution or great attenuation of drug substances. He considered it foolish and harmful to administer large doses of a drug material, whether plant, animal, or mineral, when the same or even better effect could be attained with a greatly diluted preparation. He proposed that the smallest possible quantity given was the answer to stimulate healing. Using a tincture of the animal part, mineral, or plant part, this was diluted with water, then alcohol, then shaken, then diluted further, making a product to his mind that was potentized. The greater the dilution, the higher the resulting medicine was rated. This infinitesimal part of a concentrate, one part material to one million parts of water alcohol, is introduced into the body so that the body can slowly heal itself and slow off toxins, poisons, or morbid matter that created the ill health in the first place. Because a potentized homeopathic medicine contains insufficient drug material to work on the body's tissues, homeopathic medicine cannot cause side effects as is commonplace with the prescription and over-the-counter drugs of our modern age. Homeopathic remedies are non-toxic. Hanneman's remedies were diluted following a centesimal scale, written as a C scale on labels. Constantine Herring, an American homeopath, advocated using the decimal scale, written as X or D on labels. Succussion. After each dilution, the bottles were shaken to activate the energy of the product, a process called succussion. The electrical energy, or the vital force, as Hanneman called it, is all that remained of the original substance, which was further activated and energized by succussion, the shaking of the bottle. Such a highly diluted product, when given to the body, transmits an electrical message on a cellular level an electrical message of importance that can be understood by the electrical human body. Although the idea of having no particles of material to ingest is difficult for some people to grasp, especially in this day of pills and compound and compressed drugs, what remains of the homeopathic remedy is the essence, the electrical energy of the substance. Hahnemann and later homeopathists advocated the precept that single remedies were best and doses of medication should be ceased immediately when improvement was perceived. The highly diluted homeopathic remedy is reactional. It stimulates the defense mechanisms of the body so that the body itself can fend off aggression from an invading toxin or poison, from trauma, shock, or emotional issues, or any type of harmful frequency, because such aggression tends to set the stage for an illness. Single formula homeopathic remedies are found in our Alchem 184 interpretations on SAF Online. Other uses of diluted medicine. The idea of developing a control mechanism that would effectively steer poisons, toxins, symptoms, and other maladies away from any collision with bodily functions was developed with great effect. Hahnemann found that physicians of the old school, allopathy, would unknowingly use homeopathic principles of dilution and bring about cures. For example, using an elder blossom infusion to reduce a fever, or using dilutions of rhubarb to stop diarrhea. 
or diluting parsley juice for difficult urination of young and old. In the 19th and 20th centuries, scientists discovered that taking in small samples of tuberculosis, rabies, and other wretched entities could be useful to prevent and cure those very specific diseases. Louis Pasteur used vile, diseased matter as a control mechanism to rid the body of poison antagonists when he created antidotes. When the material that causes a disease or illness is properly diluted, it can be given back to the body as a serum or a vaccine and help to control the disease disruptions. Pasteur created vaccines for anthrax and rabies, and through improved hygiene, he greatly reduced deaths due to puerperal fever, which had taken the lives of many women following childbirth. With the same dilution method, Dr. Salk developed the vaccine that cured polio. Following the work of Salk, there have been many different serums and antitoxins concocted from the poisons of diseases and other toxins. This method of creating antitoxins and serums is often used by veterinarians to treat diseased animals and for making antivenom from snake venom. In this situation, the venom is collected and injected into animals whose blood naturally creates antibodies to the poison. Cattle, goats, rabbits, etc. Blood is then extracted, the antibodies separated out, dried, and saved to be used when humans are bit by deadly snakes. The blood of humans, dogs, and cats do not naturally make antibodies to snake venom. The therapeutic healing art is the basis for the development of homeop homeopathy as a science. The homeopathic practitioner can bring about changes on a grand scale. However, it is always the effect of the homeopathic material on the human organism that is used as a guide for achieving homeostasis. Knowing the effects of the specific compounds when administered to a healthy body lead a practitioner to understand and know the correct doses and dilutions of any controlling substance. As a result of Hahnemann's work and run-ins with standard medicine of his day, the old school, Hahnemann formulated a number of principles to follow, which demonstrate the difference between schools of thought in that day and this one. True nature of a man. One principle was on the true nature of a man, or woman, or child. He claimed the allopaths of his day were looking at the physical results, not the cause. Not knowing the nature of a man, where he was from, how he lived, what he thought, how could a practitioner possibly treat the man without knowing the causes? Nature of a disease. Hanneman wrote that the disease began with man first, with the vital force, the spirit, and only later appeared as diseased tissue. The allopathic doctor's knowledge came from his practice, with other people presenting the same conditions, and thus a doctor practices. A matter of opinion. Hanneman wrote further that the allopathic doctor had no set principles or standards to follow, so it was a matter of the doctor's opinion. This is still true today in Western medicine. We are told to get a second opinion. It is a bit unnerving, or at times a great relief, to find that the second or third opinion is vastly different from the first, even when all are from well-schooled and knowledgeable doctors. Energetic medicine is defined in various ways from the alternative practitioners who use it in one form or another to the standard medical practitioners who generally oppose it. In this lecture, you will find that true energetic medicine is found in our energy science of today, quantum physics. The periodic table of elements and the electromagnetic spectrum depict our science of life and energy. From atom to human to the cosmos and back again, the micro-macro principles as taught in physics and Eastern philosophies, an energetic body requires energetic healing. And thus concludes our talk today on the four methods of healing. Please be sure to subscribe to this podcast and the show and leave a comment for any inquiries into other subjects 
or to get more details on this subject. And uh, with that, we bid you well.